Hey, just really quickly, every two weeks from this very second until December, we'll be giving away subscriptions to HBO Max, Criterion Collection, or the streaming service Movie. These are great platforms to watch some of the films that we'll be talking about during the show. So all you have to do is subscribe, leave a review, and we'll choose a new winner every two weeks. So get on it. This is Steven Spielberg, the director of E.T. E.T. was the gift that came from the heavens for me. I was in Tunisia making Raiders of the Lost Ark, and we were setting up a a shot, and I was picking up fossils in the desert, which used to be the bottom of the ocean millions of years ago. We were out there in the Nefta Desert. I was picking up, and I was remembering the end of Close Encounters. When Richard Dreyfuss goes up into the mothership, And just before that, the little alien comes down and does the hand signs to Francois Truffaut. And it just hit me out of the sky. I thought, what if the alien had stayed behind on Earth? What if he didn't? What if it was a kind of foreign exchange? Dreyfus goes away and the alien stays. And it suddenly this whole story hit me like a ton of bricks. It's often mentioned when talking about Steven Spielberg's work, along with films like Jurassic Park. And up until now, I haven't seen it. Not fully. Uh, A lot of these films that I haven't seen, I'm sure I've seen bits and pieces of it. But, you know, when you watch a film when you're a child, it either sticks in your brain or it doesn't. And this is not one of these films for me. I I have yet to see it in the same way that I watch films now. And that's something I was truly excited about, about watching this, this go around. But for those of you who don't know, Here's a little synopsis. After a gentle alien becomes stranded on Earth, the being is discovered and befriended by a young boy named Elliot. Bringing the extraterrestrial into a suburban California home, Elliot introduces E.T. as as the alien is dubbed to his brother and little sister, Gertie. And the children decide to keep its existence a secret. Soon, however, E.T. falls ill, resulting in the government intervention and a dire situation for both Elliot and the alien. There we go. I mean, this is Spielberg's ninth or tenth film, uh, and I think it continues to, continues to show off his skill. I mean, we all know what a Steven Spielberg film looks like. And if you don't, I, I certainly suggest uh, going back and checking out some of his films. I certainly have a have a a signature of, of his, which is why he's certainly considered one of the greatest directors. You know, I, I certainly think this film mixes and blends genres and and the way he directs is, is certainly quite astonishing, if you ask me. When we, when we look at things like Stranger Things or, or, you know, some other people who pay homage to or, or movies of his like Close Encounters, you know, you certainly see where where the Duffer brothers got their inspiration, and that's certainly a mark of a great director. I mean, we look at Quentin Tarantino, who we also consider a great director, generally, and he often talks about the movies and the directors and, and the, the people that inspire him that he pays homage to almost in, in each film. And I think there's something about... I think there's something about that. Like I said, there are some films that stick in your mind, some scenes that can never let go, and there's nothing else we can do but to put that into our art and, and figure out a way to express and and pay gratitude to that feeling that we got when we first seen it or felt it or heard that original piece. But what exactly can we learn from E.T.? Okay, so let's be honest. You can't talk about E.T. without talking about Spielberg because he is one of those directors that you're not quite sure where the movie begins and he ends or his involvement ends. And I think that's, again, certainly a a testament because, you know, we, we don't really have a credit for him for writing it, but we know that he came up with the idea. We know that he certainly has hands in writing the film. And that's, of course, is, is very interesting. He's noted to say that 
that at the end of Close Encounters, he remembered an image uh, of a friend uh, and had an emotion and, and, and a friendship. And, and he remembered being scared and feeling alone and, and family. And sort of the, these ideas kind of came together for him that he reached out to Melissa Matheson, who brought these ideas to screen, who's a credited writer of the film. And that, that, that's, that's where the idea began for him. And where it ended was, of course, the, the film. But weaving in the complexities of friendship and family and, and again, being noted to say that this brought him back to remembering what it was like to be a child in the middle of a divorce. And as we know, Elliot is a child in in the middle of, of a divorce-wrecked family. It's interesting to see how, how bits of his life kind of spill over into the film, despite being, you know, whatever age he is, and whatever age he was at the start of this film, and, and digging in deeper into his own life to make something really complex happen. Uh, for, for me, for me, the dialogue with Elliot and Asomi felt real. You know, the bickering between the siblings and the the mom who is completely overworked and and having to deal with having to deal with three kids. It, for me, it felt like something that that my parents certainly had to deal with, and there's only two of us. And I think we can all at least recognize recognize all of this. I, I think it's really hard to write children i think it's really hard to to tap back into what it was like to be you know these ages which i forget how old gertie was which was the youngest but i think it's difficult to do and i think it's even even so a testament to the actors who were able to play this off so beautifully of course one of them being drew barrymore which you know was a genius honestly it's you know the the wisdom that came out of Gertie's mouth is possibly the the best you know the the, the jokes the innocence is absolutely incredible Spielberg came up with this idea at the end of close encounters and 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 went along with Melissa Matheson, who brought the, the rest of the film to life and brought his ideas to life. And yeah, it, it's, it's absolutely interesting to see a, a filmmaker, and he's, of course, is not the first one, but it's, it's always interesting to see a filmmaker bring an idea in, and you know they worked with it, worked with the screenwriters heavily, yet, you know, we'll never, if you were to read the credits blindly, you would never know that they had any kind of involvement. But but of course, but of course he did because this was all sprung from, you know, the, the emotions of what it was like for a child to be going through a divorce, what it was like to be lonely and longing for family, longing for friends. And Spielberg took those complexities and and wrote from the perspective or sorry, wrote yeah, from the perspective of a child about about his family, of course, this isn't groundbreaking or new, but how often do you see the protagonist being a child and and understanding that and, and I guess seeing the dialogue between his siblings and his mother being absolutely well acted, first of all, but also you know, just realistic. You know, the little sister, Gertie, of course, played by Drew Barrymore, is phenomenal in this. And it's it's absolutely cute and endearing to watch all of these words come out of a little, uh, of, a, of, a, of a, such a young child's mouth. But, but, but to know that, you know, the, the mother is completely overworked and, and wrecked and really struggling to, to, to keep it all together for her family. And of course... You know the older brother being an older brother and picking on him and picking on Elliot anyway. It's great and it was played naturally. And you know one thing that we should talk about is Steven Spielberg's ability to work with children. 
of course, the adage goes, you know, you should never work with, what is it, animals, children, and, and I forget what the other one was. But, you know, and it's something that he does constantly. It's something that we, we're seeing more and more, and I'm not sure if it's, if it's uh, you know, what, what exactly is drawing film and television to have protagonists or, or big roles being filled by children. But I think, I think the talent that, I think when the when the materials there and the talent is there, you really get to see something quite amazing. I think it's no coincidence that Drew Barrymore became Drew Barrymore because of this role. And actually, I could be checked on that. I'm not sure if it's because of this role, but I, I certainly. But if even if this was her first role, you would see that that she was amazing, despite, of course, her family. Anyways. Uh, I, I certainly think there are moments where I had to suspend my belief because of the idea of the, you know the government agents hunting down this this alien is interesting and I think we all play that up with you know there's, there's a huge alien culture in America uh, I'm sure there is in other places but there there certainly is in America and I just found it hard to believe that these government agents w- would be behaving the way that they were behaving. I'm sure they were breaking so many laws. I, I don't know what alien laws are, but it just felt like they didn't have the jurisdiction or the ability to do what it is that they were doing at, and almost at any given time. But then again, it was the 80s, and that's the kind of fun that you absolutely have to give into because you can definitely point at it and laugh, but you have to realize that it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, also, just a device to move to move the, the story forward, but it, it certainly didn't take me out. If you're looking to start a podcast, the best place to start is Anchor. It's free. The creation tools allow you to record and edit the podcast right from your phone or computer, and Anchor will distribute the podcast for you, so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Uh, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. And it's easy to do everything to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. To that effect, I I think that some of the lessons that Spielberg learned while working on Jaws, for instance, the malfunctions that movie created, terror that people, not me, still dream about. And if that just rounding that back up, I, I think the first 30 minutes or so of the film play as a horror movie. We barely see E.T. or the men uh, chasing him. And alas, E.T. is left behind and he sets his sights for the town. He's gone. The start of the film is incredible as it sets its tone playing with daylight and nighttime and shadows and mystery Needless to say, all of the fun of the movie takes place during the day, including when E.T. gets drunk. Drunk? I just want to throw this out. He gets drunk. Again, the 80s. Because of, the psychic, because of his psychic connection with Elliot, uh, and Elliot does as well. This is a very strange part of the film. I don't know what's happening exactly. It's amazing. And, and it's it's never explained and almost never done again. And it's it's incredible, the acting of the film. Henry Thomas, who plays Elliot, I, I don't know exactly what his story was after E.T. It feels as though he would have certainly turned into one of those children who would have just been seen everywhere. Yet I, I can't tell you off the top of my head what Henry Thomas has been up to. However... Like his performances was, were were great. I, again, I'm not sure how much. I'm not sure how much Spielberg or whomever works with these kids and rehearses with these kids, but I feel like it was all played really naturally. It wasn't. It wasn't too hammy. It wasn't. It wasn't too loose. You know, it wasn't this. You know, it wasn't mumblecore like. It was. It, but it was certainly real, and it felt. It felt really good and natural anyway. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, and just while we're here talking about the, the child actors, just going back to Drew Barrymore, uh, it makes me wonder the last time we had a child actor who has grown up through the system, the Hollywood system anyway. Some of the ones that, that kind of stand out to me are like Haley Steinfeld or 
Hyunin Shipka or I don't know, like Keenan Thompson. Like who, who's the <laughs> who's the last child star that we had that has grown up through it? I, I certainly don't know. So I would love to hear your thoughts. I mean, for those of you who haven't seen E.T. before, I am sure you recognize the music. The score of John Williams is a fantastic one that is filled with emotion and worked perfectly with the twists and turns of the film. If you've ever been to Orlando, is it is it Universal Studios? You you get why it's why it's part of the ride. You you the E.T. ride, of course. You you understand what's going on there. I mean, the music. The music accompanying the film was was incredible, but of course, John Williams as a master, as I'm sure his name will come up in this podcast a billion more times, was incredible. Honestly, I'm, I'm sure there's already a, a podcast out there dissecting his work because it's it's something to behold. Okay, so I have obviously haven't gone through the entire plot of the film. I am positive that there are already a billion, or at least one, John Williams podcasts or documentaries or something out there because he's amazing. So if you're into music and scoring and stuff like that, if you don't know who John Williams is, I certainly suggest looking him up. Okay, so I haven't gone through the entire plot of the film, but we have talked about some of the bits that make it great. This being the first film that we're talking about, I wanted to make it as easy and breezy as humanly possible. Uh, so let's just do a quick recap. It's a, it's a complex script that evokes emotion, a director that's intertwined in all aspects of film, including cinematography. We didn't mention this, but of course, the production design was fantastic. The suburb they inhabited felt real and lived in. And of course, it's the production design department to, or the art department to make sure that all of these things are feeling this way and not feeling very staged. But, you know, how, how often are we seeing films or watching uh, TV where it, you're like, this this person doesn't live here. This character, does, there's no way this person inhabits the space. So it, it's always great to see that, you know, this little town, wherever it was, was just being completely taken over by these government agents looking for an alien. I, I imagine that must have been fun, and I'm sure people from the town still talk about it. So, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Is it a required watch? Again, this is the first episode, so yes. Fuck yes. Yes. Yes, it is. Again, I, I haven't seen it fully, and I gotta say, I think it's really... I, I would imagine it's really fun for children, depending on how old they are. I, for one, was really freaked out by by the, the first 30 minutes of it, again, being played as a horror film for me. But it's it's absolutely a masterclass in directing. And it really, it really, there's not much else to say beyond that. But of course, I will speak more. Uh, you know, I, I personally think what makes her a great director, a great director. There are directors of all kinds, just like there's, you know, you can pick apart a film crew and there are so many different ways to skin a cat, right? But I think what really makes a great director is having a hand in all of these departments and really making a story your own. Doesn't mean all it's going to always work out, but I, I, I do think being able to know this story and know everything front and back and, and really having a sense of self makes a difference. Again, if you just look at what happens during the daytime versus what happens in the nighttime, looking at, again, the first bit of the film, I, I, I I think it's really easy to, to see what makes this great. If you're looking at cinematography and looking at how the camera is moving, there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of budget scurrying going on. ET is a small creature and all the kids are very tiny. There's a lot there's a lot of movement with this camera, but it's all very motivated. And of course, I mean, again, I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you how he works with actors. I'm sure there are books on it. Oh, if you haven't seen the Spielberg documentary on HBO in America, I certainly I certainly suggest it or recommend it anyway. It's it's not required, but but hey, why not? Go for it. Anywho, I absolutely think this is a required watch. I can tell you that this is one of the greatest films of all time. 
So that's our episode. I'm your host, Trey Epps. Uh, What did you think of the movie? Did I get it right or was I completely off base? Leave a message and we'll play it during our our next episode and discuss. Required Watching is a movie club, so as much as I'd love to hear my own voice, I would love to hear from you guys. There's a link in the show notes where you can leave a voice message or you can hit us up on Twitter and Instagram at Required Watch. See you there. Hey, just really quickly, every two weeks from this very second until December, we'll be giving away subscriptions to HBO Max, Criterion Collection, or the streaming service Movie. These are great platforms to watch some of the films that we'll be talking about during the show. So all you have to do is subscribe, leave a review, and we'll choose a new winner every two weeks. So get on it.